Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Security Angle. I'm your host, Shelley Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst here at the Cube Research. Today, I'm joined by Brett Stone Gross, Senior Director of Threat Intelligence at Zscaler, for a conversation and a walkthrough of the newly released Zscaler Threat Labs 2024 Ransomware Report, which is out just in time for Black Hat, which is being held in Las Vegas this week. Brett, welcome. Thank you, Shelley. So glad to have you and very much looking forward to this conversation. So, uh, you know, being the geek that I am, uh, of course, I've spent the last few hours this afternoon digging into the report. And I'll admit, there was, for me, there was not really anything unexpected. Your data aligns exactly with what we've seen in our own research. And that is that ransomware is hot, 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 right? Um, you know, and, and the Zscaler Threat Labs report shows that data leak sites affirm that ransomware remains incredibly popular among cyber threat actors, and with good reason. It's really profitable. Um, in fact, your report mentioned that Threat Labs tracked an 18% in ransomware attacks year over year. So I'm gonna start with my most pressing question. Your report showed a ransomware payment, a big one, uh, in the amount of 75 million in US dollars made to the Dark Angels ransomware group. And so that is nearly double the highest publicly known ransomware payout. What does this mean? Why should we be concerned about this? Yeah, that's right. Um, so, you know, it was one of the things that we tracked over last year that was also uh, very surprising to us. And it showed a trend where, you know, these attacks are becoming more damaging, both in terms of the cost associated with it, um, and also uh, the data that is stolen, the volume of data that is being stolen by these groups. And with this particular group, uh, they've been doing things quite different than other ransomware groups. And that's what, you know, really makes this story interesting. With typical ransomware groups, um, they want to cause a business or disruption, and their goal is to pressure you with this business disruption to pay a ransom. Right. Um, Dark Angels actually operates um, in the opposite direction. They actually don't want to cause your business a disruption. They want to steal a vast amount of data um, <laughs> that they can then hold as ransom. Um, so they're stealing data um, kind of on a, another order of magnitude for most groups. So we saw, and we, we described in the report, some of the companies they stole data from uh, was between 10 and 100 terabytes of data. Um, so you're now talking about, you know, like significant amounts of customer information, your employee data, your right. client records. Uh, and this can be, you know, very, very consequential to a business. And when you look at, you know, some of these companies, the, this specific company that paid a $75 million ransom is a Fortune 50 company. So to them, obviously, they did you know some math and decided it was worth paying a ransom than risk that amount of data being leaked online. Right. That is a lot of data, and it's a lot of money. But you know, I mean, we all know that, or, or certainly those of in this, in this industry know that data is the lifeblood of every business today, and you can do a lot when you get your hands on. Uh, X number of terabytes of data and do a lot of damage. That's right. Yeah. So AI is obviously, you know, one of the you know main use cases for collecting a lot of data. Right. So more and more companies are collecting more and more data and that will become you know, more likely to be targeted by these groups that will steal that data and they can leverage that, you know, to either demand a ransom or, uh, you know, leak that information. So right. it becomes more and more difficult for consumers uh, like me and you to keep our data safe uh, because that data is exposed by so many companies and even large companies we're seeing, you know, fall vulnerable to these attacks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the uh, other thing that we wanted to call out was um, with Dark Angels, um, they actually don't want to be in the headlines. So a lot of these ransomware groups uh, you might have seen with other uh, you know, like there was a, a company made software for car dealerships and that caused a massive disruption that lasted weeks. And, you know, that was all over the news and there was other, you know, cases, lo lots of other ransomware cases where there's these major business disruptions. And what we're seeing with Dark Angels is they haven't really been in the headlines almost at all. And they do that on purpose, you know, because they don't want to be in the, the news. They get a lot less scrutiny from oh, researchers, yeah. a lot less scrutiny, more importantly, from law enforcement. Yeah. So it kind of reduces their risk of ever facing any kind of prosecution. But at the same time, they're actually 
more successful than nearly any other group, if not the most successful group. Uh, and for that reason, we rank them number one in our ransomware report this year. Well, I think that, you know, it's funny um, because there is the hubris that's involved when you, you know, pull off something of great magnitude and you want to beat your chest and tell the world. But the reality of it is uh, operating a stealth mode is a lot smarter. I mean, it is. that's a no brainer. And uh, so resisting the urge to, you know, sort of sing the praises of your dirty deeds um, seems like a smart business tactic. Yeah. You know, I noticed, I noticed when I looked at the report, you know, the alluring industry targets include really the old favorites, manufacturing, healthcare, technology, um, manufacturing, not surprisingly accounted for more than double the attacks of any other industry. Um, you know, I'm going to lob you a softball question here. Why are these sectors so highly prized and targeted by cyber criminals? Yeah, so there's a number of reasons why, um, and you know, some of those reasons is you know they may not uh, you know take security as maybe seriously as other industries, uh, but I think more importantly and, and probably the most one of the biggest contributing factors is that a lot of them can't have outages and downtime. So if you're in a hospital, you can't have your um, you know critical patients. Um, you know, be hooked up to a machine that might crash. Um, right. So deploying new uh, technologies, whether it be any kind of new software or software update, as we saw recently, um, those are risky. Uh, so if you need to migrate to kind of a new security stack and you might require downtime and outages um, and kind of a, a, obviously a major investment, um, a lot of them are slower to move to, you know, the newer you know, technologies, you know, right. that would make them uh, safer or or reduce reduce the risk associated with these attacks. Um, so outages are really and business continuity is a really important factor. Where some of these industries, uh, they just you know, they have to take things slowly because they can't you know have the risk of you know their industrial you know, manufacturing plant down for you know several days or a week or whatever that time period is. Yeah. Um, and similarly with healthcare and, and other industries. Yeah, and I think another factor here is the um, many, many, many endpoints and the vulnerabilities that come along with having lots of endpoints, you know, things that are connected to the internet, all of the things, you know, think about a manufacturing facility or think about a hospital or a clinic, a healthcare clinic setting or whatever. And you think about all of the machines and all of the things that they do, well, they're connected to the internet. And so that's an endpoint there. And, and I think another thing that plays a role here, I was having a discussion um, with a colleague about this recently and you know another thing that plays a role here is that take healthcare for instance i think some things that are connected to the internet maybe weren't always intended to be connected in the way that we're using them and so like you mentioned sometimes these organizations aren't as up to date as they need to be sometimes. Sometimes there's a lack of skilled talent. Sometimes they're trying to go it on their own rather than working with a trusted vendor partner. You know, so many things play a role here, but a lot of this really comes down to endpoints and, um, you know, they're attractive to threat actors. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's right. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, the year over year trends that you earmarked in the report were also of interest. I saw the energy sector experienced a 527.27% increase in ransomware extortion attacks. Um, that doesn't surprise me, critical infrastructure. I understand the allure there. And to your point about, you know, critical infrastructure, you can't shut this down. We serve too many people and too many vital things. Um, I also noticed restaurants, bars, and food services organizations experienced a 333% increase in attacks. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. And, and I also noticed that religious organizations experienced a 250% increase. So as I said, I understand the energy sector, critical infrastructure, restaurants, bars, food services. I understand that increase with the digitization that we see happening across the board in those establishments. And when you think about, you know, them shifting to digital payments, other digital methods of interacting with customers, say QR codes that COVID kind of reintroduced to all of us, right? 
Um, so I, I see that and that the increase there makes sense. But what about religious organizations? I couldn't draw an immediate line to why they would be an attractive target for threat actors. Yeah, so some of this is speculation, but I think it's probably, you know, like those uh, organizations may not have the security solutions in place. And, you know, a lot of um, ransomware attacks uh, are opportunistic. Um, so, like, you know, if you have a system exposed to the Internet, um, maybe they don't have a strong password. It's easily easily guessed or maybe they don't patch um, vulnerable software uh, quick enough. So we're, we see a lot of things, you know, between you know brute force uh, password guessing attacks um, to uh, these vulnerabilities, uh, or it could be spam email. Uh, maybe you know some uh, religious organizations don't train their employees for um, you know proper you know cybersecurity um, yeah. hygiene. Um, yeah. So there's you know obviously a number of reasons that they could uh, fall victim uh, to these attacks, uh, but. Yeah. At this point, yeah, it's your guess is probably as good as mine. Well, and as you were talking about it, I obviously wasn't paying any attention because I was thinking about it kind of occurred to me. I'm teasing, by the way. It kind of occurred to me that, you know, when you think about um, donations that people make to religious organizations, they make those online these days, yep. you know. And so, you know, I mean, just sign up monthly tithing or whatever it is you want to call it and a um, good Catholic girl here. Um, so, you know, that sort of makes sense too, because of course the bigger the church, the bigger repository of PII um, that you might be able to get access to. So that kind of occurred to me that that could be one of the things that makes them attractive. And to your point too, I mean, I would not imagine that most religious organizations have the most highly skilled IT talent you know, it, it just makes, that makes perfect sense. So it'll be, that'll be interesting to watch. It'll be yeah. interesting to watch, you know, yeah. next year and see what happens there and to kind of see, um, we're just speculating here, but it'll, that'll be interesting. So, you know, one of the things I learned from your report is that when it comes to ransomware, geography matters. Let's talk about that a little bit. I know your, your report showed that the U.S. experienced a 101, almost 102 percent year-over-year increase in ransomware attacks. Sweden saw a 350 percent rise. The U.K., Germany, Canada, France, Italy, Mexico, Spain, they all had significant increases in attacks. Why is it important for those of us in the cybersecurity field to understand the distribution, the, the geographical distribution of ransomware attacks? Yeah, so coming out comes down to risk. Um, you know, if you're in certain regions, you're definitely at higher risk of, you know, these attacks. Um, there's various reasons why certain uh, geographic regions are more impacted or targeted than others. Um, the United States, um, you know, surprisingly was account or accounted for nearly 50% of the attacks. Um, and that kind of shocked us a bit. Um, it, the United States has always been kind of, you know, at the top of the list, but, yeah. um, you know, now accounting for about half the attacks is, you know, something that's, is really interesting. Yeah. Uh, what we believe that the reason is, is that there's, you know, lots and lots of businesses in the U S. Um, and so essentially the criminals go where the money's at. Um, so, you know, a lot of, you know, small, medium businesses, uh, they fall victim to these attacks because, um, they just don't have, you know, the, the necessary, you know, security. Uh, solutions in place, you know, to prevent a lot of these attacks. And in some of these, you know, other regions, um, it could be, you know, like also due to uh, opportunistic attacks uh, and, you know, like some of these countries, they're bringing more and more um, businesses online, which makes them also more, more vulnerable to uh, ransomware attacks. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, in terms of um, English speaking countries, uh, that's been the way, uh, you know, in terms of cyber crime focusing um, on English speaking countries, um, that's been going on for the better part of a decade. And before ransomware, um, one of the things that we tracked for a long time, I've been doing this for, for quite some time, uh, that was all, a lot of these groups that are doing ransomware used to be doing wire fraud and, and banking fraud. So back oh, then they would steal your credentials, they do a fraudulent wire transfer or ACH transfer. Um, and they all pivoted to ransomware because it was far easier to profit and also to monetize. Uh, yeah. So, you know, with ransomware, everything's usually with cryptocurrency, uh, usually Bitcoin in particular. And, you know, the old days where they did wire fraud, 
Um, it was a complex system where they had to have money mules to you know transfer money you know from the stolen account or from the compromised account right to their account and then maybe to you know several other uh, middlemen. Everyone takes you know a cut in between you know where the criminals you know get the money and from the victim bank account. Um, so this is far more lucrative and far less complex to monetize than um, the previous you know uh, wire fraud that we saw for a long time. Yeah, I mean you know if it's easier. That makes sense. If it's more lucrative, exactly. faster, Easier right? Well, <laughs> makes it makes perfect sense. I mean, really, this is you know, this is it, it, when I talk about this, you know, and, and we talk about the advent of AI and generative generative AI and how that's being used and will be used. I mean, this is all about threat actors are incredibly motivated by financial gain. I mean, this is not rocket science, right? You know, yeah. it makes sense. They go after the, you know, the most lucrative targets. And I do think some of this and, and wonder what you think the ge geography question is, you know, the more affluent nations logically make sense to target, right? Yeah. yeah. So in terms of uh, the number of infections, um, that varies, um, but the actual like attacks that are, you know, going after, um, you know, the largest companies are generally, you know, where uh, the money is for them. And yeah. so, you know, they're constantly innovating. Um, we know that they learn, I mean, they're very smart people and they, they run uh, a lot of these like businesses and they have teams that are responsible for doing different things. And at the end of the day, um, you know, you, you would think, you know, after a group has received a $75 million payment, they might at some, at some point say, I have all the money I ever need to, you know, live, <laughs> I, I no. can but they don't, they don't. No. No, I mean, and part of it too, though, is, you know, some of this is kind of gamified. I mean, in the biggest sense of the word, right? It's like, you know, can I do this? Can I make it happen? Holy cow, look what I, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, so you sort of get that rush and that high. Why don't you want to keep, I mean, I, I can totally see why people wouldn't say, oh, I've got all the money I need. Let's just stop and yeah, and, and we've seen that progressive trend where you know, payments and rats and demands are going up and up and up. Yeah. So, you know, if they got 75 million this time, I'm guessing they probably want to make 150 million the next right. time. Right. <laughs> Why wouldn't you? So let's see. The The Threat Labs report indicated there's an almost 18% increase in ransomware attacks based on what you've seen blocked attempts across the Zscaler cloud. What does that tell us about what we may need to do more of, do differently, or focus on when it comes to combating cyber attacks? Yeah. So first, you know, in terms of the number itself, eighteen percent is actually um, lower than the previous years in terms of growth. Okay. Uh, so that's a good thing. The bad uh, thing is the payments are going up, <laughs> and so you have kind of this this uh, dynamic, and we think it might be you know somewhat. Maybe even started by this Dark Angels group, where there's going to be maybe less attacks, but they're going to be much more targeted attacks, less opportunistic, less smaller demands, and more targeted, going after very large companies, you know, for extremely large payments, uh, you know, where we see tens of millions. And I do think we will see, you know, probably you know, soon, a company that pays over a hundred million dollars. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of the growth of attacks, it's slowing, which is a good thing, but the payments are going up, which is a bad thing. Right. Um, and then in terms of like what companies can do, um, obviously uh, there's a lot of uh, technologies, including something that Zscaler offers. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things in terms of having your data stolen that you can leverage to make sure you capture uh, or identify an attack before it's too late, before uh, you know tens of terabytes of data are, are stolen. Um, when we talk about tens of terabytes of data you know, stolen from these large companies, we're not talking about a matter of hours. We're not talking about a matter of days. We're talking about a matter of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of opportunities uh, where uh, companies can do better, uh, can deploy better solutions, uh, better monitoring. Um, and also, it's important for companies that already have these solutions um, to actually make sure they're actively monitoring these, uh, these uh, solutions. Yeah. And what we see sometimes is alert overload. You know, there's companies that have various solutions and they're constantly seeing like, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of alerts a day. And then they start ignoring it. So yeah. then when there is a true positive, 
they might totally miss it. And then obviously at that point, it's too late. Yeah, I see that. You know what? I have alert overload. 10 minutes before we hopped on this recording, um, I was opening the mail and I have a letter from Ticketmaster telling me about their data breach and what I need to do. You know what I'm saying? Like, so when you think about that as a consumer and that all of, and of course, that's not the only breach alert that I have gotten or will get. But when you think about, you know, I think about my, I didn't go, oh my gosh, and rush to, you know what I'm saying? Like, sometimes it is a sense of overload. So I can only imagine what it would be like to be an IT pro and to be dealing with these massive amounts of alerts and things like that. It would be easy to be overwhelmed. It, it really would be, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's solutions that actually are designed to, you know, minimize, um, you know, like all those alerts that, you know, normal SOC team, yeah. you know, security operations center team might see. And, um, you know, there's a lot of money being poured into AI to solve some of those solutions. So, you know, AI, you know, can maybe assist with uh, reducing, you know, all those, yeah. uh, the noise and, and try to give you, you know, only things that you know, require your attention. Yeah. Uh, and obviously there's a lot of, uh, you know, work being done on optimizations. You know, if you right now need a thousand people, maybe you can do it, you know, more efficiently, but um, yeah, we'll see if AI holds the solution for, yeah. I guess, a lot of these problems. You know, it's interesting. I uh, I did a research study a couple of years ago. It's probably been, I don't know, four years ago, maybe. Um, and one of the things that we were asking uh, survey respondents was, you know, about visibility and to use, you know, uh, and really we started asking, you know, have you and have you experienced a cyber attack? And do you expect to experience a cyber attack, you know, in the next three months, six months, whatever, whatever. And another question that we asked was, do you use some kind of a dashboard that allows visibility across your IT landscape? And it was very interesting and really not surprising um, that the people who used, who had visibility, knew they were experiencing cyber attacks on a regular basis. And they knew that that was not going to change, that that volume was going to continue. They were watching it every day. And the people who didn't use any kind of dashboard, not only did they think they weren't experiencing any attacks, they didn't expect to experience any attacks. And I'm just reading those data points <laughs> once we got the survey results back and thinking, okay, well, you're going to be a victim and you're going to be a victim. You know what I'm saying? Like people sometimes don't understand the importance of having this ability into your systems and the continuous monitoring, you know, technology is your friend when it comes yeah. to cybersecurity. It really is. And you can't combat what you can't see. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And, you know, a lot of these, you know, security solutions, you know, like there might be, you know, one vendor that sells, you know, like an endpoint, one vendor that is you leverage for network monitoring and another right. vendor you use for, uh, you know, DLP and, and so on. And, you know, there's been also a lot of work in the area of, like you said, having these dashboards where it integrates all these various you know products, um, so you can see the whole picture. Uh, yeah. Because you know one solution might only give you part of the picture, and it's important obviously to see the bigger picture. Um, so you're you're absolutely right in terms of these companies. You know, like if you don't know what's happening, it's probably too late. And uh, <laughs> you, all good luck. Yeah, exactly. All these companies really need to spend the investment. You know, whether they're big or small. Um, and I, one of the things we also expect to see over the next few years or so is these very targeted attacks like dark angels, where they're not uh, going after, you know, the masses, they're going after the biggest of the big, yeah. and they want to make as much money as possible. And it's going to require, you know, a lot of effort to make sure that they're not successful. And one of the things that we called out uh, in the ransomware report, um, that's also, you know, kind of an area of, of focus that we're, we're monitoring is voice-based attacks. Yes. So they'll call your IT department or your help desk and say, hey, I'm locked out of my computer. Can you give me access? Yeah. And you know, some of these are done by English speaking uh, attackers. And so you might not hear or might not expect, you know, some of them to be obviously malicious. Yeah. And we've seen, you know, like casinos you know, fall victim to these attacks. Um, we're also seeing companies right now being targeted by a different group um, where they're actually um, sending spam to 
people just at, the, at this company, they're, they're doing it much more selectively. It's not spamming kind of, you know, like millions of email addresses. They're spamming individual companies. Then they're using, um, you know, things like LinkedIn and Zoom Info to identify people who work at those companies. Oh, yeah. They're calling them on the phone and they're saying, hey, we're from your help desk. Uh, we're here to help solve your spam problem and people are giving them access to their systems. Yeah. And from there, they're able to compromise their systems. And that ends up being kind of a, an initial um, area where they're able to then access that corporate network and move laterally and then compromise yeah. the entire network. Uh, people are our are, are greatest asset and our weakest link when it comes to cybersecurity. And it's just an, it's an innocent thing. You know what I'm saying? I mean, if you got a call from a help desk, you know, and you work for a medium sized company, of course you're going to help, you know what I'm saying? So it's not really, um, out of the realm of the normal that somebody would fall for something like that. That's a, that's a hard one to combat. Yeah. And we think it's going to become even harder uh, because, um, technology like voice cloning and deep fakes is getting better and better. Yeah. Um, we have actually seen our own CEO, um, someone was, uh, used voice claim for his voice yeah. uh, and attempted to deceive one of our employees. Um, uh, and then there was actually an article, uh, written recently, uh, where, um, the CEO of Ferrari, um, there was a person impersonating him. Um, and you know, that person, um, kind of got a little suspicious based on what they were asking and asked him, Hey, we were talking about a book recently. What um, was it? Can you tell, can you tell me what it was. And yeah. you know, that person didn't know, obviously didn't right. have that level of information because uh, they were a scammer uh, mm -hmm. and they hung up. So there are uh, things you could do uh, potentially to you know, protect yourself against those attacks. One being obviously if you have um, your personal information or you had a conversation with somebody, um, the other thing you can do is you can hang up and call that person back uh, because yeah. a lot of times they use like caller ID spoofing. Um, so there are defenses, but these types of attacks, you know, if you have a believable voice at the other end, maybe you think it's your boss or you know, maybe yeah. you think it's the CEO, um, people you know, generally are more trusting by voice than over email or yeah. text. Absolutely. Well, and you know, CEO phishing and bishing and smishing, th th that's not new. I mean, haven't we all gotten, you know, a text from reportedly your CEO asking you, Hey, I'm stuck in a meeting, you know, I really need some visa gift cards. Can you run out? You know, you know what I'm saying? Like all yeah. of that, whether it's email, whether it's text message. So it only makes sense that, you know, the next frontier for that is voice, but it is so I talk about this with my colleagues all the time, because here I am, you know, a public figure, I'm on video everywhere, all over the internet, you know, cloning my voice would not be at all difficult. I mean, I've talked to my, my kids, my husband, my 87 year old mother-in-law about, you know, not trusting, you know, you get a phone call from somebody, it's that they say it's me or one of the girls, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, trust, or trust, but verify or have a safe right. word, or don't be afraid to, you know, say that's a smart, your suggestion of, you know, hey, I've got to hang up. Let me call you back in just a second, you know, and that sort of thing. So those are good tactics. But I think that this voice business is something that is not widely known. So this is really something that I think we need to add to the conversations that we have internally throughout the organization about the fact that it's happening and, and giving people thoughts on what to do there, you know, because it, it, this is kind of an unknown. Um, you know, I do want to touch on, I want to give you a shout out here to, I love, you guys um, launched a mobile app here at uh, that I saw at Zenith Live, which I love because, you know, the whole, um, I, I love, well, I think often about the heavy load that CISOs and, and security pros carry around all day, every day, and truly how they sleep sometimes, I'm not sure. Um, but what I love about your app is that, you know, you can roll over before you get out of bed and open the app and see what's happening across the system and just have an instant bird's eye view. Um, and another thing I think that the app does is, you know, kind of brings you um, news of the day, like what's happening across the cybersecurity landscape. And so, you know, now that you have to check it before you get out of bed, I'm sort of just nerdy enough that I probably would do that. Um, but I think having that kind of information at your fingertips is really a valuable, a valuable tool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about 
uh, you know, the whole new regulatory landscape and and disclosure trends. You know, I, so we've got some relatively new SEC regulations. They mandate the timely reporting of a of material cybersecurity incidents and require the submission of detailed information about a company's cybersecurity risk management and governance. And, and that's all a good thing. Um, one of the things I noted that was mentioned in the Threat Labs report, Brett, is that some companies, in some instances, pretty big, fairly well-known companies are failing to comply with these rules. And you know, I think this is a challenge, and you and I chatted about this a little bit before we hopped on, but, um, you know, the EU's regulations as it relates to data privacy and security and AI are, are, are much um, are much meatier than what we have here in the United States. So what do you see, and I will say it concerns me that, you know, we've got these regulations that are designed to protect um, and, you know, really built around being transparent about security incidents and, and the, the risk factors and that sort of thing. But what do you see ahead as it relates to noncompliance? Do you, do you think that, you know, does, does the government today have any teeth to force compliance? So they, they definitely have teeth, but I think the question is like, there will be probably a progressive system where more rules are put in place that yeah. will actually define what it means to be material and what it uh, yeah. what exactly needs to be reported. Because you know this is a, essentially you know the first time the government has required publicly traded companies to disclose a cybersecurity incident. Right. Before that, um, there was many companies uh, that we saw that uh, they paid many significant ransoms and they were never in the news and no one right. would ever know. And they were happy about that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, so one of the things actually we wrote about in the last year, uh, the last year's ransomware report was what impact will this have? Will it reduce the ransoms? Will people pay less ransoms because now they have to legally disclose it? And, you know, the short answer is um, we definitely haven't seen uh, the actual you know, payments decline at all. In right. fact, it's the opposite. Right. Um, what we have seen is more um, disclosures. But the transparency of the disclosures, I think, needs to be better, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times you'll see very vague descriptions about there was a cybersecurity incident, um, but they don't provide any details. They don't provide, you know, like details if they paid a ransom. They don't yeah. tell you how much they paid if they paid. Um, they don't tell you really anything other than a dollar amount, uh, you know, if that, 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 that it was caused by an incident. Right. And, you know, there's a lot, you know, I think that, uh, should be done to protect, you know, the customers, the clients, yeah. the employees of these companies to make sure that, you know, when there are these incidents, that they're transparent. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, the shareholders have a right to know and everybody, you know, who that data was stolen from uh, has a right to know. Yeah. Uh, so I think the SEC will probably, um, you know, take more aggressive actions, especially for those who are not compliant. Uh, you know, I think they purposely wrote it in a way that could be interpreted different ways. Um, but I do think we will see at some point the SEC um, probably, you know, uh, sue some of these companies and, and charge them, um, you know, with violating these new rules. Um, and after that, you know, that may also set some precedents for companies to be more forthcoming. Well, the reality of it is that it is perfectly understandable why companies would be reluctant to report, right? I mean, this is kind of like your driver's license. Like it's a known fact that everybody lies about their height and their weight on their driver's license, right? <laughs> well, you can't, you shouldn't be able to not disclose and you shouldn't be able to, and, or if you do disclose, you know, understating the realities of the situation the very, I mean, I would expect companies would do that, just like I expect people to lie on their driver's yeah, licenses. They do. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, 
know what I'm talking about. You're really six five. Um, but anyway, I just think that we need to get to a point where that transparency can be trusted, you know. And and so it'll it'll be interesting to watch and see how regulations evolve and policies and that sort of thing. And you know, obviously ransomware isn't going away. So it'll, it'll be interesting to watch this. Yeah. And, and most of those disclosures, you, like you said, are, um, you know, underreported and absolutely, you know, you know, they definitely, most of them try to diminish yeah. the actual <laughs> attack itself and what was lost, which is understandable. But the reality of it is, as you said, it's stakeholders and shareholders and, and employees and their families, and it is customers. And, you know, I mean, our, our data, you know, when you think about some of the biggest breaches out there, it's employees and consumers who bear the burden, yep. really. And um, so it so expecting greater transparency and truthfulness should not be too big of an ask, in my opinion. We'll see. We'll see. Brett, we'll see if that happens. Yeah. All right. Well, in closing, it's clear that ransomware ma remains one of the most attractive tools in a cyber criminals toolkit. There's every reason to expect that to continue. But that's really why zero trust security and pr prioritizing robust layered defenses, engaging, as I was mentioning earlier, in continuous monitoring. You can't combat what you can't see um and you know paid incident response capabilities all of these things are business mission critical and and it's a clear so clear that the ransomware threat will continue to evolve and present new challenges threat actors are going to get better at targeting like you mentioned um and, you know finding those high value targets and this is you know you were talking about this and I, i'm going back to the gamification thing and and you know this is like you know, Call of Duty, I'm not a gamer, so I think I've got the name right, Call of Duty or whatever, you know, you 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 get the adrenaline rush when you get to the next level or you accomplish this or whatever, whatever. And some of this is, you know, they're kind of beating themselves, you know, I got 75 million this time, let me get 150 million next time. And, you know, I mean, that that's how their brains are wired and that's understandable. So, um, and they're gonna get better. And they're also going to get better at leveraging AI to help them be better and to help those you know, who are not English as a first language speakers to write better copy or to you know, use voice, um, voice activated things. And so it's, it's really going to be interesting to watch this evolve. But I'm going to ask you one last question, Brett. What advice do you have for CISOs and their teams based on the ransomware data that you're seeing? What's the, your best advice that you want to leave them with? So the, the best advice is actually, I would say, quite simple advice. And that is, you know, there's a number of basic hygiene, uh, IT hygiene, um, you know, measures that you know, most companies can take. And that will reduce, you know, the risk significantly by just taking, you know, basic you know, measures. And some of those are, you know, well-known, you know, things like two-factor authentication. Uh, believe it or not, a lot of attacks, you know, the, the Snowflake attack that you mentioned with Ticketmaster, a lot of these companies were using two-factor authentication. Yeah. Um, you know, things like making sure you actually leverage the security solutions you have. So if you're, yeah. you know, getting, you know, kind of this alert overload, you know, either finding a solution that, you know, narrows down, you know, those alerts to something more manageable where you can identify those uh, network monitoring is incredibly important. Um, you know, like we see, you know, terabytes of data being stolen over, you know, days and weeks. Um, that's something that you would hope, you know, like a company should be able to catch. Um, having, you know, an endpoint where you can kind of see what's going on and um, making sure if there's any threats, you can remediate those quickly and, and preventing, um, you know, these attacks from, from moving on further. Um, and then, you know, we mentioned, you know, zero trust. You know, it's something that, you know, we offer. Uh, it's also incredibly important because you have to really eliminate the the lateral movement and that's the key piece that you know all these attacks share where they're able to get access to one computer and that could be you know somebody clicking on something it could be you have some vulnerabilities and some software like your vpn software uh, where you know an attacker can leverage that to gain access to your corporate network um, but anyway they get in they're able to very frequently move from one computer to another and their goal is to get access to a user who has a domain admin account. And from that user, then they have access to your entire corporate environment usually. Um, and that's, you know, when we see the data exfiltration and then the deploying of ransomware. 
So with the zero trust solution, you're eliminating that lateral movement component. Um, and that makes it also much more difficult for these attackers to you know, discover you know, what assets you have, uh, discover what data you have and steal that data. Yeah, good advice, good advice. Thank you. Brett Stone, Gross Senior Director of Threat Intelligence at Zscaler. Thank you so much for joining me today for this conversation and a walkthrough of the newly released Zscaler Threat Labs 2024 ransomware report. To our viewers and listeners, I will share a link to the report in the show notes so that you can dig into this report as well. And Brett, again, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a terrific conversation. I hope you have a great week ahead in Vegas at Black Hat. And I'm sure we'll be talking about ransomware for some time to come. Thank you, Shelly. It's been a pleasure. All right. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in. I'm Shelly De- Shelley Kramer. I almost uh, said my name wrong. I'm Shelly Kramer, Managing Director and Principal Analyst at The Cube Research. Uh, the Cube is here bringing you all the latest in enterprise and emerging tech news. So keep it right here and we'll see you next time.